Uh, you know, so uh, I, you know, I've come from, I fly up from rainy Tampa, Florida this morning, and I get to New York, and it's raining. It's actually kind of chilly. And as I was walking in, it was a little chilly. And as I was walking in, I think I heard some lightning. Uh, if there's any uh, New York, oh, so- <laughs> sorry, sorry. Oh. Had, had, had to do it. Sorry, guys. Sorry. <laughs> uh, it was a good game as long as we won, so <laughs> for us. All right. Well, welcome, guys. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you so much. Let me get my, uh, my little remote going here. And it's an interesting shot of an eagle, isn't it? <laughs> Bet you guys don't know how to do that. There we go. <laughs> the, the Rangers fans went and back and got me. I'm just happy we get to watch hockey for another week and a half to two weeks. So, um, All right, so do me a favor, guys. We're, we're in it. We're going to forget the intro and all that stuff. Um, I want you to look up at the screen here. I want you to think about this photo and think to yourself, um, do you think this was hard to take? Okay? And I would say most people out here think, yeah, it's you know, kind of hard to take it. And if you, if you don't think it's hard to take, you should leave because this class isn't for you. But I think most people would think it's hard to take. So then think about some reasons why this would be difficult to take. Gear, location, definitely. You've got to be in the right spot, and you've got to have you know, probably a longer lens to, to be able to do it. Um, this was a 200 to 600 zoom lens, so it's nothing you know, so outrageously unaffordable. So, but what other things make it hard to take? Um, autofocus, right? Does the camera find it? Can you follow it? You know, shutter speeds, did the camera lock on? Was the shutter speed fast enough to freeze it? Did you have the right aperture, exposure settings, you know, shutter speed, aperture, ISO combination, all those things. I think all those things come into play when we think about a difficult photo to take, right? So I'm going to play a video for you here. And it is, I have a little video monitor that I'm able to attach to my camera. So it lets me through HDMI show you what my camera is seeing at the time. Everything that it's everything I'm seeing when I look through the viewfinder, what I'm seeing. So I want you to watch this video. Just absorb. I, I narrate it a little bit here. That's uh. There we go. What you're seeing is the little green boxes are me pre-focusing. That's what uh, most mirrorless cameras will show you. And I'm looking up at the sky. Nothing's going. Like, I have no idea what I'm doing at this point. I'm just looking for something to happen. Then I hear something. And then I think I missed it. And it was out of focus. But now it's back in focus. And now I'm trying to get the not clip wings. I'm trying to zoom out. I'm trying to zoom in. I'm trying to figure out what they're going to do. Try not to fill up my buffer. The clicking is actually me shooting, so. They, they won't stop. Like, they keep going at it. And then finally, I think, oh, still. I stopped shooting, lost focus several times throughout. And then one of them shooed the other one away. OK? So I want you to think to yourself, here's a couple of photos. All right? This was, I think this was the poke that started the whole little squabble. And then here's another photo. So we got like a foot on the beak, and here's another photo. Good action, right? Got like beak in the foot in the you know, beak around the neck. I don't know if you can see that, but it literally is around the neck. So what's the difference between those photos of action, okay, and something like this? That perfect moment, the frozen water and the fish Right there. And that, that won't last very long because that fish will be gone in about a second. Or that moment where the eagle grabs the fish out of the lake. Or another one. Aerial little battle. One of them's upside down, got a fish in his talon. Same thing here, upside down, fish in his mouth. What's the difference in those photos? Ansel Adams, who was primarily a landscape photographer, I think summed it up pretty well. Good photograph 
is knowing where to stand. Guys, that's the only difference between that first thing that you saw, that video that you saw, that I introduced, that after you saw those three photos, of the, they're marbled godwits is what they are. After you saw those three photos and you saw my video, you probably thought to yourself, he just got lucky. There, there was nothing, there was, there was no skill happening there. You were in and out of focus, clipped wings, didn't even know it was gonna happen, got to it late, lost it, right? That was lucky. But when you see those other photos and you see those moments, I think in our mind we start to develop this image like, wow, this photographer nailed it, right? We start to develop that mindset. And I want to introduce you to, because we're going to get to all the camera settings and stuff, but I wanted to introduce you to this presentation this way because there's one key concept that I really, I think is the most important. And then from there we can talk about all the camera stuff. I call it embrace the chaos, okay? Nobody, let me see what I got. Now, nobody went out and said, okay, wind's coming from the south, southwest today. And I'm gonna go out and I know that that eagle is gonna fly over here, drop down, grab the fish, and then the other eagle's gonna come out. They're gonna meet right around there in the sky and then the other one's gonna go inverted, and I'm gonna pick up my camera, boom, one shot, and I got it done. Nobody does that. Nobody, ever, anywhere, anyhow, okay? But yet, when we see those photos, when we scroll through social media, or we look at prints, and we look at all this stuff, when we see those photos, I think that's what we start to develop in our mind, right? Like, wow, the, the skill that it took. Guys, I, I mean, I hate to say it, a lot of it was luck. A lot of it was just me knowing where to stand. So as we go through this presentation, I want you to embrace or think about that, that term, embrace the chaos, okay? Because I think it's the most important part of BIRD and just let's say wildlife photography, especially fast action photography. It's never perfect. And I always like to tell people perfect is the enemy of done, right? You will never ever get it perfect. But once we can get you to the point where the camera's not in the way, we can start concentrating on where are we gonna stand, where are we gonna get out. So when these moments happen, even as haphazard as you saw, right, it only takes one frame to get the shot. You saw how crazy it was, my camera's up and down, they're all like that. Every photo you saw me show after that, if I showed you the before and after photos, you'd say, he sucks as a photographer. <laughs> but they all end up that way, and I think it's such an important concept as we get into all the other stuff, because where I want you to be at the end of this half hour or so, is I want you to know that if you've got a camera and you see a bird flying across the sky, you can point your camera up at that bird and know you will get it in focus and sharp because you've got to get that thought out of your head so that you can forget about that thing that you're holding and put yourself in the right spot. Observe what's going on, watch the behavior, do all these things so you can get those magical photos that really I think means something rather than just a bird floating across the sky, which is cool to capture, but I think you're gonna, you're gonna want more. Um, okay, so quick intro, my name is Matt. Uh, if we've met before, hi again. If not, uh, you find me at mattk.com. I got online courses, presets, workshops, all that fun stuff. Uh, I am a Sony artisan of imagery. Thank you for Sony for uh, helping me be here today and my gear and my portfolio, everything's over on the website. Uh, if you're interested, Grab your, uh, grab your phone, take a picture of this screen, or you can scan it or whatever. I have a little field guide. Uh, it just got some tips, and I, I actually, I forget the tips in it, and I go, like, I look at it myself, and I'm like, oh, God, I forgot about that one. So um, take a picture of the screen. Just make sure you note the link in there, because it's actually not mattk.com. So, but take a picture of the screen, and if you scan the QR code, it should actually just take you straight to that link there. Okay, so good little field guide for you. It's got little descriptions and tips that you can basically put on your phone. It's a PDF. Get out there and shoot and just, you know, from time to time, it's always good to look like, am I doing these things? Uh, maybe before you go out and shoot. I'll put it up again at the end if, uh, if you missed it. Okay, who, what, why? I put this slide in here because I think it's really important. I get probably 10 emails a week from people that apologize for being a hobbyist or enthusiast photographer. And I'm putting this here because I'm here to tell you, you are the audience. 
Okay? The audience is not a pro wildlife photographer. You know why? Because they don't exist. They might have existed 20 years ago. Nobody's making a living as a pro wildlife photographer today. And if they are, they're probably teaching. Okay? So I wanted to alleviate you to think you're, if you're just into photography as a hobbyist enthusiast, you just enjoy it, you are the audience. You're who, who most people around here are speaking to. Okay? And I think it's a wonderful genre. I think it's a challenging genre of photography to get into. And it's something that a lot of you can do right outside your home. I, so I live in Tampa, Florida. Um, amongst other reasons why it's been great to live there, one of the things is as a landscape photographer, it's like there's not many things I can do. So five or six, seven years ago when I started getting into wildlife, I'm like, it's finally starting to pay off. Now I've got a lot of stuff around me. All right, what we're going to cover. So the three pillars of how to get a great shot. Uh, exposure settings, autofocus, and then the creative part, and the light, and the backgrounds, and those things. We'll talk about all of them, and if we have a little bit of time, we'll get to a, a quick photo edit at the end, too. Number one, exposure settings. So this is the first pillar. All right, this is going to be aperture, shutter speed, ISO, the exposure triangle, everything that makes up the overall exposure of your photo. So ap our exposure overview. We're generally going to want manual mode. Okay. We're going to want manual mode, remember, mode, exposure mode, not focus. We're never going to use manual focus mode for fast action photography. Um, aperture generally to the lowest f-stop that lens will go to. From there, your shutter speed, it needs to be faster than you think. We're going to dial into each one of these in just a minute here, but it's a quick overview. And then the only variable in most of this is going to be your ISO. Your ISO is going to change based on the light that you're in. Okay? So as we talk about manual mode, remember mode, not focus, this is what's going to allow us to set aperture and shutter speed and ISO. Okay? And we're actually going to take ISO off the list in just a minute here. We can't let our aperture and shutter speed change, which is why we can't use a automatic mode on the camera. And I know manual mode might be scary for some people that haven't done this before. Trust me, you'll get there. And you'll get there a lot faster than you think. Okay? So aperture. For most bird photography, we want our aperture to be the lowest f-stop setting that lens can go to. So it could be f4, 5.6, 6.3, f8, whatever your lens goes to. Your zoom lenses usually you know, start creeping up a little higher. Your prime lenses will generally let you get down a little bit lower there. But whatever it is, and I'd say 95% of the time, 99% of the time, I'm never going to change this setting. Okay. Shutter speed. This needs to be faster than you think, and it's why we can't put the camera on aperture priority mode, which is a happy place for a lot of people. Um, because aperture priority mode will let us set the aperture, but the camera is going to figure out the shutter speed. And we can't let that happen, because I'd argue shutter speed is the most important part of any fast action photography. Okay? You've got to control the shutter speed. It's going to have to be faster than you think. I can tell you from having taught this to many, many people, over and over again, people that implement the system come up to me and they're like, my photos are sharp now. I had no idea that I was just using too low of a shutter speed. Um, for birds, for perch birds, which, I mean, there's still action. The birds generally don't sit still. At least the ones we want them to don't. Um, I'm going to do one over the focal length of the lens. So if it's a 400 millimeter lens, I'll do one 400th. 800, 1 800. And that's mostly hand holding. That's just to help me hand hold a long lens. If you're on a tripod, you can start to creep lower than that. Just understand if you go to 1 60th of a second and that bird's moving a little bit, you're probably going to have a little bit of a blurry photo. But 1 over the focal length is a good number. For birds in flight, it would be 1 1600th to 1 3200th. And it's just going to depend on what I'm looking at and doing. And do I see fast action? Or is it a great blue heron that's just gliding across the sky? One sixteenth hundredth will be fine. If it's two eagles battling like you saw earlier, those guys can fly 70 miles an hour. All right? So I'm going to up my shutter speed because, remember, sharp before anything. What does upping my shutter speed do? It ups the ISO as well. I don't care about noise. Sharp before anything. All right, ISO. So this is going to change. In every situation, it's going to change based on your light, it's going to change based on the time of day, all those things. So you're going to raise and lower your ISO based on the lighting conditions. Okay? Now, 
That's going to seem really hard, and you're going to see in a second here because I have another video for you. It can be hard. So that's where auto ISO comes in because auto ISO will float the ISO to a level to get you the good exposure. So I think I've got another through the lens video here. I think this will kind of, you'll be able to see it a little bit better uh, than me trying to show pictures of it. I'm pointing at my computer right now with a photo of birds up, which is pretty cool because it engages autofocus. It even will engage eye autofocus if I wanted to. So it's kind of fun. It's a fun way to practice and uh, see what the camera will do. But let's talk a little bit about that manual exposure mode that I was talking about, okay? I have control over my aperture, all right? So right now it's at the lowest aperture setting for this lens combo that I have on. I believe I have a teleconverter on as well. Now I can make that f-stop number higher, which is gonna let less light into the camera, which is why the photo is getting darker because I'm in manual exposure mode. If I was in aperture priority mode, the camera would automatically pick a shutter speed and it would make that shutter speed longer and longer and longer, which is not what I want for my birds. Okay, I don't want that shutter speed to get longer as I change my aperture. Now, that would really never happen because essentially what I'm gonna do is keep it on the lowest f-stop number I can for the entire bird outing. I don't really have any reason to, to change that. Okay, so it's gonna be at the lowest f-stop number. And then right now I'm at a slower shutter speed where I would say, okay, if they're perched, I might try to use this, maybe a little bit faster, but I might try to go this way. But if I think they're gonna take flight or I, I switch situations and action happens somewhere else, then I can go in and I can Interestingly start enough, I don't think the video, my, my voice is going, but exactly the video is not going. <laughs> now, how does the camera compensate? Well, it's in manual mode, so it just shows me a darker photo because again, I'm like... letting less light in. So then I go into ISO, and I can just change. I'm pointing at my ISO computer center. right now with a. Uh oh. All right. We're going to start that over again. I'm pointing at my I'm computer pointing right now with a photo my... of birds. So something happens when I fast, when I hit the slide twice, it like doubles. Let's see if it happens. I'm pointing at my computer right now with a. Not sure what to do here. I'm pointing at my. It'll be a little right echoey. Photo of birds up, which is pretty cool because it engages autofocus. It even will engage eye autofocus if I wanted to. So it's kind of fun. It's a fun way to practice and uh, see what the camera will do. But let's talk a little bit about that manual exposure mode that I was talking about. Okay, I have control over my aperture. All right. So right now it's at the lowest aperture setting for this lens combo that I have on. I believe I have a teleconverter on as well. Now I can make that f-stop number higher, which is gonna let less light into the camera, which is why the photo is getting darker because I'm in manual exposure mode. If I was in aperture priority mode, the camera would automatically pick a shutter speed and it would make that shutter speed longer and longer and longer, which is not what I want for my birds, okay? I don't want that shutter speed to get longer as I change my aperture. Now, that would really never happen because essentially what I'm gonna do is keep it on the lowest f-stop number I can for the entire bird outing. I don't really have any reason to, to change that, okay? So it's gonna be at the lowest f-stop number. And then right now I'm at a slower shutter speed where I would say, okay, if they're perched, I might try to use this, maybe a little bit faster, but I might try to go this way. But if I think they're gonna take flight or I, I switch situations and action happens somewhere else, then I can go in and I can start to raise my shutter speed to be exactly what I want it to be. Now, how does the camera compensate? Well, it's in manual mode, so it just shows me a darker photo because again, I'm letting less light in. So then I go into ISO and I can just change my ISO setting here, okay? All the while, I have that histogram up in my screen. On my camera, it lets me have that little histogram up in the bottom corner. So all the while, I'm monitoring that as I'm shooting. And if I start to you know, make my shutter speed longer and longer, you'll see that histogram starts to spike up on the right-hand side. So that's my cue. If I see that, I know I just have to bounce over to my ISO, and I know I can lower my ISO and get it back down to a lower number to get me a good exposure. So it's a, it's a nice way of retaining control over the situation, especially for bird photography. Shutter speed is so important. Okay. Shutter speed is really, for me, the most important part of all this. So I need to make sure I have the ability to dial in exactly the shutter speed I want 
also exactly the aperture I want, and then I just use ISO as a way to get me a good exposure depending on those two other settings. Now, in another example, I just wanted to quickly demonstrate auto ISO, and you can see what's happening here. So I've gotten in my camera and turned on auto ISO, and you'll see on the lower bottom part of the screen there, I have my limits there. So I can set the lowest limit and the highest limit of what I want the ISO to be able to go to. All right, so what's gonna happen now? Okay, I want you to watch. I've got my, I've got my aperture dialed in, and I've got a shutter speed dialed in. I'm gonna press the shutter halfway down, and it's gonna show you what the ISO is right now given the current framing of the photo, okay? So now let's say I think the birds are gonna take flight. I just put my thumb onto the dial that changes shutter speed, and I start to raise that shutter speed, and you'll notice, different from the previous example, see how the photo exposure is not changing? It's staying exactly the same. Well, take a look at what happened. I'm gonna press down halfway on the shutter again. See, my ISO is now 8,000, okay? If I go a little bit faster, I press halfway down. See, now it's at 12,000. Now, if I start to go faster and faster, I'm gonna get a darker and darker photo. The camera said, hey, he said, don't go above 12,800, so the only way to compensate is to just leave the ISO where it is and you'll get a darker exposure. But as I reduce that setting, okay, I'll go back down to a slower shutter speed, press halfway down, see, now ISO 2000. And as you move around, that'll change. You can actually see the ISO changing as I change the framing here, okay? So that's auto ISO can be very, very useful, especially in especially if you're in a situation where the light is changing quite often and you don't want to have to worry about it. Okay, so huge, like game-changingly huge. If you've never used it, your camera has it, go look it up in your manual, turn it on, and think about what it did, is it took manual mode on my camera and it made it automatic. Because no matter what setting I change, I still get a good exposure. Pretty cool stuff. All right, autofocus. Two areas of autofocus, focus mode, focus area. Focus mode is gonna be single or continuous. All right? Some cameras, I think Canon calls it servo. Um, single or continuous, and don't, don't confuse this with the drive mode on your in your camera, which a single frame or multiple frames per second, that's the drive mode, okay? Generally, for fast action stuff, we're gonna be on a lot of frames per second. This is focus, single versus continuous, and I believe I even have another video. Again, it's probably gonna be a little echoey because I have to hit the button twice really fast, and I think both of them start audio, but here we go. To very quickly demonstrate single <laughs> and continuous focus modes, let me show you what I mean here. So I've, again, got my, um, I've just got a photo up on my computer screen, and it's just fun to see that it's a great way to practice because the camera still works, but right now I am on AFS, or single focus, okay? Which means when I press the shutter, right, it's gonna find focus using whatever focus area I've told it to, and, and that's a separate video, but it's gonna find focus, right? So it found focus on the bird's eye. Now, even as I recompose, right, there's a lens sitting right in front of the, the computer there, even as I recompose, it's not changing because I have my, my finger pressed on the shutter. So if I was continuously, taking pictures right now, the camera would still continue to focus in that one spot, all right? Even if I start taking pictures over there, okay, you can see here, let, let it grab focus again. Okay, here, let's, okay. And I'm gonna take pictures and you actually see kind of a little blinking on the screen there. See, it's not changing focus over to the lens. Now, let's go ahead and switch us into AFC. Okay. So now I'm in AFC mode, and you're immediately going to see the difference between because the camera is going to start moving around, and it's going to start even as I, I pan around, it's going to you know show different focus areas that it's picking up on the ducks here. Okay, as I move over to the lens, eventually it's going to grab focus over on that lens. Okay, it's continuously focusing. I have the shutter pressed halfway down, so it's continuously focusing here. Again, I'll go back over there. It grabs focus on the birds. Go back over here gonna grab focus on the lens there, okay? And as I start shooting, watch, I'm gonna start taking some pictures here. You're gonna see the flashing on screen and I'll start panning over to the ducks and you'll see it moves, all right, ready? 
see that? So it moved over, it's continuously focusing, it's continuously trying to find focus, and that'll change as long as you're in AFC, or servo as some cameras call it. Okay, uh, also the little green boxes that bounce around, if you've got mirrorless, your camera does that. Um, automatically, you don't have to even tell it to. If you have a DSLR, just know you've got autofocus points in there, you might not be getting the visual feedback, but that's what's actually happening behind the scenes there. Okay, so just as important as focus mode, in fact, probably more important than focus mode, is focus area. And these are two separate things on your cameras, okay? Focus mode, fast action, we're generally always gonna be on continuous, okay? Focus area, we've already told our camera how often to focus, right? Now we need to tell our camera where to focus. It's got a big screen, and then you've got all these other options that you're gonna see in a second. Uh, let's go through here. So single point, zone, group, dynamic, wide, auto. Uh, I put up just Sony, Canon, and Nikon on there, but they all, Olympus, Fuji, they all have these different options in there. So you're generally gonna have a little single spot. As a landscape photographer, that was my lifeline. I would move, you got a little joystick on your thing, you move your spot around, where in the landscape do you want to focus, okay? Portrait photographers use it often as well. Um, and then you generally have a bigger area. Then a lot of cameras have a zone, which is not gonna be the full screen, but more of a zone. And then so, most cameras will have a, an entire, like look anywhere in the frame. That's essentially the decoder ring for these things, okay? I'm gonna play uh, another video here that should help this, oh, hold on, uh, that should help hit this point home. And again, all cameras are gonna call it something different. Forget about eye focus, guys. If you see it catch on the eye, honestly, guys, it, it, it's a cool feature. It, I use it so much less than you would ever think. So even though you think like, oh, I gotta have eye focus, trust me, you don't. So what you're seeing here is I've got a video monitor attached to one of the ports in the camera. So I'm actually recording what I see through the viewfinder. So this is exactly what I'm seeing as I'm taking pictures. And you can see all those little green dots, that's focus points, okay? When you're shooting with mirrorless, you will get to see these focus points. They're there in a DSLR camera. That's why whenever it says it's got two and three and 400 focus points or whatever, these, these points are there. You're just not seeing them in an optical viewfinder because it's basically a glass view of the world. Um, it's not an electronic view, but an electronic viewfinder, which is what most mirrorless cameras have, will show you this, okay? So you can see this camera has bird eye autofocus as well, which um, if you're close enough, it, it'll work great. But I mean, it's very few cameras have that right now. And most cameras will do great with your autofocus, but you'll know, you can see all these little green dots. When you have your focus modes set up this correct way, you'll see what's happening, okay? You'll actually see. The nice thing about this aspect of it, if you're photographing, if you're shooting with a mirrorless camera, is that you actually know if you have an in-focus shot before you even go review your photo, all right? So as I'm shooting, as long as I'm shooting at one thirty-two hundredth of a second, which I know freezes the action, I don't even have to go look at it to know that the, the shot is in focus. Here's a good example where I'm on a wide focus area and there's some trees and branches and other moving things and it's picking up the wrong thing. But as soon as I go to the center zone, you can see it picks it up. Um, and then if the bird puts its head down, it doesn't know what to focus on, but eventually it finds it again because it's limited to a lot smaller area to look for that focus. So I'm not confusing the camera as much as I would if it were a wide focus zone. So this isn't a great example of where I would use wide because there are just so many different contrasty things in there. Now, as we switch over to something like this, you can see I've got that center focus zone, but the Osprey's head goes out of it sometimes as it picks its head up. Um, so you see it loses it, but as soon as I nudge that center zone up, I say it's center zone, but it's a zone. As soon as I nudge it up, now my keeper rate is much higher because it knows just where to look, All right? Take that example a little bit further. You can see I'm now purposely moving the camera around, trying to force the, the bird out of the, the zone, as you can see here. So as I move it out, sometimes you'll see it just it loses focus on it or it reverts to other autofocus points that don't necessarily pick up the eye. But disregard the eye in that, and that's just the way your focus points will work. Whether it has eye autofocus or not, the point is that 
it's looking in that zone for something to be in focus. And as soon as I switch it to that wide area, now you can see as I start pressing the shutter halfway down to focus, of course, this has the eye focus, so it's finding the eye, but if, if it wasn't turned on, it would simply use those focus points on the bird. But look how far and how far out to the edges it actually goes. So those are gonna change. Your camera has them, but those are gonna change based on the situation that you're in. If I've got, if I've got a bird flying across in the sky, and even like the eagle shots that you, you guys saw earlier, I'm generally going to be in a wide, the widest area possible because there's nothing really in there that's going to confuse the camera. I'm pointing up at the sky. Again, you saw all those trees and everything. If something happened to be in front of trees or a busier background um, or I were closer to trees, then I might have to start reducing that area to a smaller zone or even a spot in the center and have to be really good about following it. Okay, and that's hard. Don't, want to, don't, don't make any mistake. If you put a little center point that you can't move around the, and you try to follow it, it's, you know, it's a difficult thing. But luckily, the autofocus is so good, and especially in cameras made in the last four to five years, that you would be amazed at how well it picks everything up in there. Okay? So as you're out there, I would say, number one thing, review, go get your manual, review the autofocus zones. You have them, review them, get to know how they work, get out there, practice with them. But once you become familiar with that, I'm telling you, you get the shutter speed combined with some autofocus zones and your keeper rate will go through the roof. You will no longer worry about, oh, am I gonna get the shot? You know, and I said in the beginning, I want you past, am I gonna get the shot? I want you to be able to point that camera up and know you nailed it so you can concentrate on the other stuff. Speaking of other stuff, so we're moving on. said there was three pillars to this whole stuff, uh, this whole thing. So we're moving on to the, the third one here, which is the creative. So we got light, we got backgrounds, and we have action, all right? So does this look familiar to anybody that's done wildlife photography? Okay. You didn't do anything wrong. You didn't do anything wrong. This just happens to be back to that first, uh, first group of slides, where you're standing, all right? This is backlit, all right? So the first, the first big creative thing we want to try to do is we want the sun pointing at our back whenever possible. It's not always going to be possible, and I'll talk about that in a second here. But we want the sun pointing at our back because remember this, and you guys all know this. If you look up at the sky, and you see this beautiful, colorful, maybe it's, a, maybe you're, it's a macaw. You're in Costa Rica, and you see this beautiful macaw flying across the sky, but it's black. And that's what you see with your eyes. What do you think the camera sees? Because the camera doesn't even come close to seeing what our eyes see. So if it looks like a black or dark shadowed bird to you, it's going to be that much worse inside the camera. And I'm here to tell you, all the post-production in the world doesn't make it any better than this. It's backlit. You're shooting either into the sun or you're shooting up into the sky with a bright, bright sky behind it, okay? And that's just the photos that you're gonna get. Now, I'm not gonna say that I don't shoot during these times. This was like an aerial battle for eagles and I knew I was shooting in bad light, but it's still kind of fun. Like I review the, every photo I take is not so I can post it on Instagram. I, I post this many of my photos on Instagram. I take it because it's fun. Like I can sit back on my computer and I can look through and I see, I see stuff I had no idea that the wildlife did. You see a, a more intimate view of it. So I keep it and I shoot it, but just know if you're going to share it, it becomes a little bit harder to be shareable. So what do we want to do? We want to get that sun behind us. Huge difference, right? Sun behind us, sun at our back. That's what we want to try to do. The lower that sun is to the horizon line, the softer, prettier light that it's going to be. By no means, that's, what we, that's one of the wonderful things about bird photography, is I don't have to get up before sunrise anymore. <laughs> In fact, to me, the best light, I, I barely even shoot. If I do get someplace before sunrise, I barely even shoot. Number one, the ISOs are through the roof. Number two, I'm just not a fan of the light for that. So I like a little bit more light. So a half hour, hour after sunrise, up until two, three hours. The only time this starts getting tough is when the sun's overhead. 
Now you're going to cast really bad shadows. But if you can get that sun behind you, they call it the sun angle. I want you to look at the lack of shadows on here. And that's what the sun behind you does, is the animal's not going to be casting shadows on itself. I'm not going to say that there's not a couple here and there. But as that sun gets off angle behind you, now a bird lifts its wings, and now all of a sudden it's casting a shadow over its face. We're getting nitpicky here, but these are all things to try to strive for. Sometimes you just can't control it. I'm still going to shoot, but hopefully it gives you a better idea of what we're looking for. Backgrounds. This is huge. Okay? So what we have to, we've got to get distance between the subject and the background. Okay? And this, this in spite of, of what I think a lot of people think, is not coming from the lens. Like a 2.8 lens would not have made it look better than an f6.3 lens. Right? So many people think that. They think, oh, I've got to get an f2.8 lens or an f4 lens. You can do so much. In fact, I, the majority of the way I work my backgrounds, I'm shooting with an f6.3 lens, is I'm trying to find a spot where there's a lot of distance behind it. Because that's what's going to throw off or throw out that background to be that nice, soft, buttery type of a look. The other hard thing is shooting down at the wildlife. Okay? If you're going to shoot down at it, what happens to the background? The background becomes the ground, and the ground is only this far away from it. So you get very, very cluttered photos like you see here. Even if you're going to shoot up, if you look at the top left, the owl and the baby owl, again, you're going to get trees behind it, so they're going to be very in focus. But if you can get yourself to the place where you can shoot across at something, where there's not a lot of stuff in the background, your, your quality, the perceived quality of that photo goes up. Years ago, I took, I took my 70 to 200. My, my sister's uh, little girls were, were, were smaller back then. We were at a pool, and I took a picture with my 70 to 200 2.8. I took the picture, and she took a picture with her iPhone. And she's like, yours looks like a, pro that looks like a professional did it. I'm like, thanks, sister. <laughs> she's like, that looks like a professional did it. What was she really saying? She was saying, look at that blurry background. Because that was the only difference between hers and mine. Hers was sharp, mine was sharp, same light, same everything. The only difference is that background separates your, your subject from it. So if we can shoot across at it, we get those nice, soft, blurry backgrounds. Um, the photos that you see here, so, I mean, if the animal's on the ground, you want your camera almost on the ground. And I know for a lot of people, trust me, I don't want to go lay down on a sandy beach. And I know our shoulders, knees, whatever, I, I had a workshop with somebody, I did a one-on-one -on -one workshop with her, and she was in her late 70s, and I was like, well, we got to get down low. And she's like, I'll get down, but I'm not getting back up. <laughs> I'm like, I hear you. So I'm like, and that's why I brought, and I whip out my little camping chair. You know those little tripod chairs? Are about, they fold up. They look like a little mini tripod. You expand them out. They're only you know, this high off of the ground. You set them down, sit down, and then most of your cameras have a flip-out screen. So I sit down on the little camping chair, and I put my camera down on the ground. I flip the screen out, and I just have my finger on the shutter, and I'm taking pictures. I had somebody walk by me, and they're like, are you doing video? Or I'm like, stills. And he's like, how are you getting sharp pictures? I'm like, I'm shooting 3,200th of a second. Me hand-holding is not the issue. At 3,200th of a second, I can toss the camera in the air, let it auto take a picture. It's going to be sharp. <laughs> so there's ways around this stuff, guys. Bring a chair. You got those little mini tripods, whatever it happens to be. But these were taken with f6.3 lenses. Look at the background. It's because I'm shooting across at it, and I tried to position myself in a spot where there wasn't a lot of clutter behind it. People on the, the photo on the right hand, people swear that's got to be like a 1.8. It's 6 point, F6.3. But the background was so far away, it looks like it. Um, OK, action. So we talked about little action stuff earlier on. Um, where do you go to find this stuff? You know, Water is a great place where you can find birds around water, where you can find, you know the birds are feeding, where there's babies, of course, give respectful distance to the wildlife if you're going to do that. But anything where there's water, anything there where there's feeding happening, those are great places to catch action. Okay, Because you know there's going to be action happening. You know the birds are going to be trying to feed. You know that birds are going to steal food from each other. So that's a great place to find action. Um, it doesn't have to be those types of stuff. We got a little hanky-panky going on in the top left. 
Uh, um, you can't see the reddish egrets next to get out of the water, but um, I love if the bird's sitting and it's just not flying, even if it moves its wings, to me it just has a dynamic nature versus just a bird sitting on a perch. It's not all bad. It can be very, very pretty. You can see wings and colors and things, so there's not a perched bird can be beautiful, but just getting the wings outstretched. That was a little branching owl, um, which, by the way, I'm not going to assume anything because two years ago I didn't know what branching was, but if you're a birder, you know what it is. If you're not a birder, branching is when the, the, the babies start jumping from branch to branch. Right? Again, I didn't know two years ago, and I was afraid to ask. So, um, bottom, le bottom right, again, that's just a reddish eager, you know, looking for a fish with its wings out. Um, get a tree. <laughs> you got the little ruffled feathers on the right-hand side, and then that bird was just taking off, so I got low and used a little bit of grass as foreground. Um, again, so all those takeoffs and landings, I think, are very interesting. So whenever I see a bird, I always stop and wait and look for a takeoff. Sometimes it's a half hour later and I get it. Sometimes it's a half hour later I don't, but I'm always looking for a takeoff. So creative recap. Sun at your back. I didn't talk about this. Wind at your back. We want the sun and the wind at our back. Why wind at our back? Because birds fly into the wind, typically. All right? They typically fly into the wind. So if you're out and the wind is in your face, you're going to get a whole lot of butts in your face because they're always going to take off and they're always going to be flying away from you into the wind. So sun at your back, wind at your back, uh, background separation look for, camera low to the ground, that one is so, so important. Um, and then action, just watch, listen, look. I mean, you saw the first video. Okay, I had no idea that was going to happen, but it was fun to watch. All right, let's talk just a little bit about gear here. So cameras, DSLR, mirrorless, let's help you, whatever you got. You guys, you can, I, I've seen amazing wildlife photos with both of them. All I'll tell you is the mirrorless you saw it in here. It's not just Sony, Canon, Nikon, they all, it's just, you get a little bit more visual feedback in there. But both can make great photos. Crop versus full frame. Full frame's gonna give you a little bit better high ISO performance, so for fast action, you get a little bit better ISO performance. Again, I've seen beautiful photos taken with both. Trade-offs, you know, the more expensive cameras, you get more frames a second. ISO performance, quality, autofocus settings. But guys, I got a, I got a Sony A6300 that I can take out and make beautiful photos with. With a 75 to 350 lens, it's this big. And still get razor sharp, gorgeous photos with. It might only be 21 megapixels, so I can't print a 60 inch photo but I can get an amazing photo with it, and most people today are sharing online. Lenses, ideal range, one to 500, two to 600. That's, you know, with bird photography, you can never have too much. So keep that in mind. Zoom versus prime, I'm always gonna recommend zoom. Um, just the versatility and the weight of it, it's just too hard to get out there. And then number one, you know, they cost $12,000. So uh, the zoom lenses, especially the zoom lenses today, and it, the zoom lenses that the, these companies are cranking out are, are amazing. Teleconverters, I'd say yes, but you gotta test your gear. Every gear is a little bit different. 10 years ago, teleconverters could soften the photo. Today, I've done my test with my 1.4. I don't notice anything. But every camera company is a little bit different. Depends on when your camera's made. So I would take your tripod out to the front of your house and test it out. Put the teleconverter on, take it off, see what you see. See what you see versus just cropping in on it. Uh, a couple of lens tips, so focus range limiter, number one, if you look in the top right corner, that's going to help limit the range, so where would we use this if it was out in the backyard, I had a little bird feeder set up, and the birds were close, but my camera keeps picking up something in the distance, I can set that focus range limiter to only look close to me, and vice versa. If it keeps grabbing something close, you can set it to go off in the distance. Image stabilization, lots of controversy on this, look it up in your lens manual. For my lenses, I'm able to keep it on regardless of how fast a shutter speed I shoot, but um, I've looked that information up. So again, you gotta look it up. Every lens is a little bit different, and if you can't, send an email to the, the manufacturer. And then those little lens preset buttons. If you have them on your camera, use them. They can be used, you can turn on and off auto ISO on them. 
Um, you can switch between different modes on them. You can switch between different focus modes. Your hands are already out there, so it can be really useful to use those little preset buttons. So the feature's there, use it. Okay, let's see here. So, tell you what, because I want to leave some, where's, uh, is David here? Uh, all right. I know I'm off here in like 10 minutes. I want to make sure I leave some time for your questions. So, this is, this is like an eight or nine minute video. So let's do this. I can very, very quickly tell you my wildlife editing uh, process, and then I can point you over to the website because I got a ton of free videos on there. But um, rather than play an eight or, nine video, eight or nine minute video, with wildlife, I don't typically do a lot of editing, okay? It's gonna be shadows and highlights. It's gonna be open up the shadows a little bit, close down the highlights a little bit, but I'm not typically gonna do that much photo editing as we would to a landscape photo where color can be very interpretive, right? Um, shadows and highlights can be very interpretive. But with wildlife, I'd say that's probably a little bit more true to the photo. So I start off in Lightroom. I mean, I gotta be honest with you guys, a lot of times I click auto. <laughs> like, you would be amazed at how many times with my wildlife photos I just click auto. And it does such a good job. Um, from there, if I have distractions to remove, I'll jump over into Photoshop. Um, and then my, probably my saving grace is Topaz Denoise. Shooting at these ISOs that I shoot at, the noise is definitely there. Um, I love Topaz Denoise. It just takes a 6400 ISO photo and it makes it look pristine. And the beauty of it is, is it actually sharpens the photo while it's doing it. So I don't even need a sharpening step in there. So uh, again, you know, Lightroom, I'll jump to Photoshop to remove distractions if I have them. And then at the end of it, I'll run Topaz Denoise on there. But I've got a, a, a if you just go to mattk.com and click on tutorials, you'll see me do this 100 times on there. So I won't take up your time with it. All right, there we go. Um, really quick, if you want to learn more, head over to the website courses. I got a bird photography course on there that dives deeper into all the stuff that you saw here. I've also got a wildlife photo editing course on there. You can just click on courses on the website. And uh, a big, big thank you to everybody for coming out today. So thank you, guys. Thanks. If you didn't catch the, uh, if you didn't catch the link from earlier, uh, I'll leave that up on the screen there for you. OK, questions. We got. What's your take on back button focusing? <laughs> you had to ask my take on back button focusing. Um, my take on back button focusing is I don't personally use it. Uh, I've tried out both, and I know it becomes a religious battle amongst many, many groups. Um, back button focusing was created for one reason, and that was focus and recompose in a time where cameras didn't have the features they have today. So what do I mean by focus and recompose? You got a person standing in front of a mountain, you're shooting film, Pre-focusing was a tricky thing because you might actually take a picture while you're pre-focusing. So you got a person standing in front of a mountain. You want that person in the bottom right-hand corner and you want the mountain to nice rule of thirds. So what did, what did we do? Well, we would pre-focus on the person and then recompose the shot. Okay? Because most of your focus points revolved, again, we're going 30 years ago, revolved around the center of the thing. You didn't have all the options we have today. So you would focus then recompose. That's why back button focus was created. That situation no longer exists today. I much, much prefer one finger to take a photo. For me mentally, it, it doesn't make sense for me to have to press two buttons to take a photo. And then I can use my thumb for something else, like changing the shutter speed quickly. Good question though. And trust me, the entire industry will tell, me, tell you that I'm wrong and use back button. So you can't go wrong with it because I know many wonderful photographers that use it. Uh, yeah. Do, oh, sorry, sorry. I'm supposed to follow the microphone. We'll get over here. Hi, uh, you ever uh, put the a full frame um, mirrorless into crop mode to get the perceived extra reach? That have I ever put the full frame into crop mode? Yes, I have done that because I've been asked about it a thousand times and I wanted to do the test and see for myself. So when you put a full frame into crop mode, all it's doing is literally 
cropping the full frame picture in your camera. It's not giving you more reach. It's not zooming out further. A full frame sensor looks like this. A crop frame sensor is smaller. It's just cropping in camera, doing it destructively, and not giving you the option to crop out of camera. So whatever works for you. If you're not going to do any photo editing at all, if they're never going to hit the computer, then yeah, might be a good thing to do. If they're going to hit the computer, take three seconds and crop it yourself. But the quality is no better at all. Yes? Yeah, I was just wondering, what do you shoot with? Um, I have a Sony a7 IV and a Sony A1. And then I've got the 200 to 600 millimeter Sony. Um, I do have the 600 millimeter prime. I don't use it nearly as often. I'll use it if I think I'm going to be in really low light and I know all the actions far away. But I'd say 70 to 80% of the time, my 200 to 600 is what's on the camera. Two questions. One is selfish. Yeah. Um, well, the first one is uh, Topaz denoise. Mm -hmm. Is that a lot of work to denoise your, your things? Is that what? Is that a lot of work to denoise your um, photos? No, I, it's literally one button. Like I click, it goes into the, it goes into the plugin, and I click the four up view because there's four different models, mm -hmm. like AI models to choose from. So I, I look at each one, I click on the one that's best, and I click apply, and I get out. Okay. It's 30 seconds. The selfish question is, you've got pictures of one of my birds. Where do you find the reddish egret at? Um, Fort DeSoto Beach in Florida, just outside of Tampa, St. Petersburg, Florida. Thank you very much. Okay. So one, I mean, it's a bird earth power. You have people from all over the world go to Fort DeSoto Beach. Yeah. Hi, Matt. It's winter. <laughs> Thanks a lot for this, by the way. Thank you. I have two questions. Yes. One with regard to your aperture, keeping it as low as you do. Um, I find that when I'm shooting birds, there's like a sweet spot. And sometimes, I mean, what do you think about like a 7.1 aperture? I know that all of a sudden then I have to deal with ISO and deal with shutter speed, but I feel like I'm getting a sharper image that way with a higher aperture. I've, I've never personally experienced the sweet spot. <laughs> um, and I talked to, so I was, talk. talking to a, I was talking to a, <laughs> a, 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 a technician with Sony about the, about the sweet spot. And he said, can you imagine the backlash if we made an f2.8 lens and told people, but don't shoot at it because it's not sharp? <laughs> <laughs> like, why buy an f2.8 lens if you can't shoot at f2.8? So I haven't experienced the sweet spot. I'm not going to say that it's not out there. I did hear about it more 20 years ago or so, 25 years ago, when I first started getting into, into digital. But... I think in today's lenses, I don't know that it's as a thing to worry about. And but I'd always say do some tests, too. Sure. And just the single focal point rather than the, um, the zone. Mm -hmm. um, I heard you say that, obviously, it's very hard to follow with a single point. Yeah. But I find that I get sharper images with that single focal point. Um, any advice with regard to the trees and stuff in the background with the birds flying? Um, you would say use the zone for that then because then the zone starts grabbing everything. What camera are you using? I'm using a, a DSLR, the Canon 90D. Yeah. It, it, could be, it could be your catch and focus on some of those trees and that's why the single points are, are just coming out better. Um, and again, back to the DSLR, you know, the only advantage of mirrorless is as I was shooting, I would know if it caught focus on the tree, because I would see the green boxes jump over to it. On the DSLR, you're not necessarily getting that feedback. So it could be. You might need that, that point to be a little bit more reliable. Matt, I want to know how you deal with weather changing, where you try to get to a nice bright day, but then it gets either hazy or the background is just shut out. Uh, how do I deal with it, like exposure-wise? Yes. Auto ISO. Auto, auto ISO pretty much takes care of it. So as the light, that's the beauty of it, right, is you know, I'm, I'm shooting and the bird, as I'm shooting, the sun is coming in or out of a cloud. Without auto ISO, those seconds could actually produce a brighter photo, but with auto ISO, it's automatically changing it. I think we got one back there. How are you metering? 
How do you meet her? Do you use just the... Uh... Uh, matrix evaluative, 100% of the time. Okay. I've, I personally, I haven't changed my camera from matrix or evaluative metering in 20 years. So for me, my meter is the screen in the back. Take a picture, look, looks good. Yeah. And just the uh, exposure accordingly. Yeah, and one of the things I, I didn't talk about, which uh, all, to actually both of these questions, so when you're in manual mode, if you don't have auto ISO on, exposure compensation does nothing because you said, I want to manually c control the camera. So you can move the exposure comp dial as much as you want, nothing will change. But with auto ISO on, exposure compensation works. So if auto ISO is reading a little bit dark or a little bit bright, you can use exposure compensation to do micro adjustments on there. Hi, um, do you use Topaz megapixels? I don't, uh, Gigapixel, which is an upsizing program. I don't, number one, because I think Photoshop does a, a plenty good job and I've, I've done back-to-back -back comparisons. Uh, number two, I have shot I started shooting the Nikon D800 back in like, when did it come out, 2012? So I've shot with a 36 plus megapixel camera for the last 10 years and I don't print any bigger than 36 megapixel cameras. So I don't really have the need to, to upsize too much, but when I do, I just use Photoshop. Anybody else? Oh, got back there. Any advice for light fog shooting? Early morning sometimes. Early morning. Um, probably, I mean, the only thing I'm going to probably bump that exposure compensation. I think it, it'll foggy early mornings can sometimes uh, trick the camera to going a little bit darker. So I'll bump that exposure compensation a little bit brighter. But um, nothing else besides that. It's actually foggy mornings are great for autofocus. Because if there is anything moving in there, like especially the, the more foggier it is, it generally picks it up really well. We good? I don't see any. All right. Cool. I think we're good. Guys, I'll hang out out there if uh, anybody's got any questions or anything like that. But thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you.